Uh, it was actually, that was, uh, uh, I don't know what, it, what music that's from. This is uh, Welcome to Human Services. Thank you, everybody, for being on time. I wasn't the one on time. I apologize. So to Kurt Rutzen out there who was here 15 minutes ahead of anybody else, I apologize. But um, a couple of things, members. Uh, I, I passed out the, uh, in, in with your, your, your uh, packet. There's also a, a, they finally settled the jurisdictions. <laughs> So, yay, and, and if you look, there are two pieces of paper, members, that are at your purview. Uh, Senator Wickland's committee, which is called Health and Human Services, and, and our committee, which is Human Services. And um, it just gives you an idea, that breakdown of the state agencies, the licensing boards, the other groups, the budget jurisdiction, and other issues. Um, not to get down a rabbit hole today, although I'd like to, because there are some things that I have concerns about. You put us in charge of one jurisdiction, yet you put money someplace else. That's something that we need to kind of vet through or figure out just what that means or where do bills go. Uh, Senator Wicklin and I are going to have to have that conversation because I'm sure she has the same looking at uh, what falls in her jurisdiction that also falls in this jurisdiction. and so. We're going to keep uh, Mr. Monahan busy um, uh, for the next couple of weeks. So not putting anybody on the spot. I want everybody to just kind of have that at your purview. And if there are any questions, which I do have, um, you know, maybe next week uh, we can sure uh, talk about it as a committee. And then the other thing in front of you is, uh, you know, as you know, Minnesota and its rich history of county-based services well, there's a welcome reception for legislators from the Minnesota Association of Counties, and that's on uh, uh, Wednesday, January 18th. That would be uh, today. So if anybody wants to go to that, uh, I'm, I'm told that there's going to be steaks served there. And every, no, there's no steaks there, Matthew. So, But uh, that's in front of you as well. And then um, with that, members, uh, as we look at our agenda and we look at our priorities for the year, now that we have our jurisdictions, I want people to start thinking about, and I sent out an email to everybody on the committee, just to kind of have a, an idea or a thought process about where your lanes of, of uh, expertise are, where your lanes of passion are, because um, as we look at the, the vast uh, majority of services and, and, um, and uh, uh, other issues that we're dealing with as a as a as a as a group, it's going to take all of us uh, because there's you know there's 200,000 people in the state of Minnesota that are counting on us, and not that I'm going to bring it up again, but I'm gonna. Of course, you know, um, 1.12 or 1.2 billion dollars. I'm going to get to that one, Senator Fate, uh was underspent by the department, and you know with the FMAP money coming in, there's in the surplus there's 1.825 billion dollars. That's money that should have been spent um, on the folks that we care about here, and and I'm going to say that globally, and I'm going to keep saying that because if anything, we know the industries that provide the services and supports to people with disabilities and to our elderly. Um, are hurting with 53,000 caregiver positions open. Um, and, and I just, like I said in, a, in an article, Bloys Olson did an a, a interview with me. I, you know, it's let's get people to start caring, caring about caregivers and caring about people that are receiving services uh, in the great state of Minnesota. And so uh, with that, uh, members, I just wanted to get that as you're starting to think about what, what it is within the jurisdictions where you really want to dig down a rabbit hole and, and, and tackle and work on. And I know Senator Rasmussen sent me that he's got interest, big time interest in long term care. And so, uh, and I know Senator uh, Utke and, and uh, Senator Fate, of course, the 245D World, the day, day, day and habilitation programs and, and adult day services, they kind of, so as you guys are looking at that, think about what you'd like to. Um, kind of take leads on and, and help us as a group really tackle uh, what's in front of us. And so, and, and, and that's a great segue to what we're, what we're here talking about today. Uh, in front of you, members, are going to be the Minnesota Council on Disability, and then, of course, we're going to get an overview from them as well as an overview of the Ombudsman Office for Mental Health and Developmental Disabilities. And, and I think that your, um, this will be good for us folks. And so I, I don't know who, uh, who wants to go first. Do you guys want to come up? Do we just want to flood the stage and have a, an open gestalt kind of conversation? Or do you want to 
you know, give us a PowerPoint presentation so we can sit and, you know, have a discussion for three hours about what you do. Um, but I don't want to get to the what's or the, or the how's. I really want to get to why you do what you do, right? And, and the fact that both the agencies in front of you members have been underfunded for many years and there's such a deep need for advocacy, and not in the sense of advocacy, but the, the advocacy that help people understand your rights, roles, and responsibilities and obligations, not only as agencies, but also as a, as a citizen. So um, uh, with that, let's, let's start with uh, uh, Dave Dively and Trevor, and, and uh, we, have a, we have another elected official with us too. Are you coming up too, Nicole? So um, Nikki, anybody else? Come on up, Linda. Thank you. Uh, and before you guys start, members, any any comments or questions regarding what I just spent six minutes dirging on? No, no, no. Senator, I'm not sure if this is the time or the place. Um, to get into the jurisdictions, but there was some significant, for example, I'm a foster parent. I believe I'm our only foster parent. I got into this committee because it covered, at least last time around, foster issues, and now it's moved to another committee. Yeah, that's, uh, thank you, Senator Mitchell. That's exactly the, the conversation. And some of the things that we thought should have been in here, and I, the reason why you wanted to be on here was because that's germane to your lived experience and, and that makes sense so um, I don't I don't I don't have an answer for you on that <laughs> except you know we should uh, probably talk about how to engage you in that process and Senator Wickland you know you have an expert sitting here at this table that isn't at your table and so um, there is some there is some intersectionality and if I overuse that word I'm not too bad because I think the rest of us should be talking about intersectionality right there is some intersectionality of kids in foster care <laughs> foster care kids who are done with the system 75 percent of the homeless youth that are out there were once fosters right we know that right so there's a there's a gap system in there there are also kids in foster care when you look at the Children's Bureau federally will tell you the majority of the kids in foster care have some kind of unique special need that is either either a medical special need or educational special need. So having said that, those types of things should, there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to bring a bill through here. We would just probably have to stop to Senator Wicklund's committee, but we can sure bring anything forward or have that discussion in here um, and, and, and do that just because I see that as as, as integrated process. Does that make sense, Senator Wickland? You got a comment on that or? Well, thank you. I, I just say I'd, I'd like to work with you, Senator Mitchell. I mean, we, yeah, we can talk about um, how past what we got to this point or if you have bills that and specific issues that you want to talk about. I'm happy to talk about them and find ways that we can work together with Senator Hoffman's committee. Thank you, Senator Wicklund. And, and to that point, Senator Mitchell, too, we can initiate a bill from this committee. We can have the conversation in this committee. We just end up having an extra stop. And if I'm, if I'm wrong on that understanding, then somebody's going to correct me in the next day or two, or I might get a text in the next five minutes. But you absolutely, um, we, have a, we have a commitment within there as well. So does that, does that help? So thank you. Thank you. Who's going to go first? And you know what, Dave? I suppose I go to you, the 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 uh, executive director. Uh, people don't know who you are, so this is a time. Introduce yourself. All four of you, introduce yourself, and and uh, and um, welcome to the committee. So thank you, Mr. Dively. Thank you, Chair, members of the committee. Um, my name is David Dively, and I'm the executive director for the Minnesota Council on Disability. Uh, the Minnesota Council on Disability is an independent state agency that is charged with the civil rights protections, advocacy, and technical assistance around disability laws, civil rights, and protections for people with disabilities. We are governed by a board uh, that's appointed as our council by the governor, made up of citizens, and we have our chair, Ms. Uh, Villa Asensio, here with us, and I'd like to have her as our, uh, the council board really guides the work that we do as a voice of the people kind of kick us off here. So I'm gonna pass it over to our chair. Thank you, uh, Mr. Dively, and uh, Honorable Villancencio, you're uh, you know, a city council member where, but welcome to the committee. 
Uh, thank you, Senator Hoffman and committee. Good afternoon. My name is Nikki Villavicencio, and I am the chair of the Minnesota Council on Disability. I live in Maplewood with my family. In July of 2019, I was appointed to MCD by Governor Walls. My patience for the disability community to have dignity, respect, and independence in Minnesota was wearing thin. We had already been in multiple care crises for years. Being a disability advocate for over 14 years has taught me a great and many things. The solution to our crises are always collective answers. My hope was that MCD could be the shepherd for this disability community, and that is why I applied to be on MCD. As I got my feet wet quickly, I understood that our council is a governing body that advises the governor, state agencies, and you all, the state legislature. All of the everyday work is done by our valiant staff. I also learned of our shared vision that Minnesota should be a barrier-free environment where every person has full access to all areas of life, and that this vision is strengthened by our principles of accessibility, equity, and independence. In March of 2020, I was appointed acting chair just as the COVID-19 pandemic took hold of our everyday lives. This was a frightening time for all, but you don't know, but you don't know when or if your everyday services will be there. It is, it is overwhelming to say the least. So for MCD, we were led to make some influential changes. Typically, a chair of a state agency, as you probably know, is not too bad of a gig. We facilitate meetings, work to understand the strengths of the council members, we meet regularly with the executive director, assist in on onboarding new members, and have a key role in planning future meetings and events. Now, chairing during a pandemic at this time is a different animal. There is no doubt that leadership focused in on the true meaning of governing, not by desire only, but by necessity. MCD underwent many great and difficult changes. Our major transitions have strengthened our council board and the policies and oversight of the agency to improve operations and strategic results. As chair and a member of the Minnesota Disability on Council on Disability, we look forward to continuing the work with the governor, the legislature, state agencies, and Minnesotans to achieve the vision of equity. In the new year, we have many priorities to improve the lives of all Minnesotans. But of them all, my council is eager to reach out and understand more of the complexity that is disability in Minnesota. Thank you for listening to me today, and I sit for any questions. Thank you, Chair Villancencio. Any questions? None. Mr. Dively. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and members of the committee, and thank you, Chair Villavicencio. So to formally introduce myself, I suppose, um, my name is David Dively, and I'm really blessed and honored that the council appointed me as executive director about two and a half years ago to the Council on Disability. I'm a white male. I'm wearing black glasses, a blue uh, suit jacket, and a black and blue tie. I'm hard of hearing with uh, several other disabilities. I'm a parent of a son with autism a brother to a sister who uses waiver services to maintain independence in her community. And my parents are both profoundly deaf and use American Sign Language, which is also my first language. These issues around disability rights, protections, services, education, employment, are all deeply personal and professional to me. I've been working in this field in general for seven years, and as I mentioned, about two and a half years at this agency. We deeply appreciate the opportunity to be here to provide an over overview of the work that our independent state agency does and a little bit of the landscape of what's going on in Minnesota for people with disabilities. The members assigned to this committee, uh, are, it's a crucial committee with significant impact on the level of independence, services, choices, and quality of life that people with disabilities have in Minnesota. So I thank you for your willingness to take on this challenging committee assignment. People with disabilities live in each and every one of your districts and in every county throughout the state. I appreciated this committee chair, Senator Hoffman's opening remarks earlier this legislative session during the calendar by reminding us that these issues are very real, need pragmatic solutions and investments, are not partisan, and in fact, 
our agency is nonpartisan and it's about the people that we all serve together. There's three themes that you'll hear us speak about as I represent kind of the bigger picture mission of how we work. Trevor Turner, our public policy director, about the policy work that we do, and Linda Gremion about the operations and how we operate as an agency, that there are three themes that you'll hear frequently. We work as a host and a convener as an agency, meaning that we bring different people, advocates, organizations, state agencies together to work together. We work as a bridge, combining or connecting government leaders, whether it's executive, judicial, or legislative branches, to people with disabilities directly. And that, uh, as evidenced by our council member, who, or our council chair rather, who is a member of the public, we are driven by the people of Minnesota with their strategic goals in mind to make sure that we're lifting up the voices of people in Minnesota who are directly impacted the work that we all do. A little bit of the demographics about disability in Minnesota to get you oriented is that uh, our agency is charged with essentially every kind of disability community that you can imagine, from the ones that you think of right away that may be visible disabilities, all the way to things like complex medical conditions, HIV AIDS, mental health, veterans with disabilities, and so forth. So it's a much broader scope than some people may originally think. We are also not able to get accurate and effective data on the number of people with disabilities in Minnesota because of the way that we do demographics. So as a best practice, we use national data to interpolate to Minnesota. Based on the uh, CDC, which notably does not include anyone institutionalized, does not include people who are incarcerated, nor does it include children or mental illness as its own disability category, here is Minnesota's general population. Approximately 25% of the citizens of Minnesota have a disability of any kind. 13.7% have a mobility disability, 10.8 with a cognitive disability, 6.8% with a disability that prevents them from living independently, typically due to executive functioning, such as being able to run errands on their own. 5.9% are deaf, hard of hearing, or have another kind of disability in that uh, hearing disability, and about one third of that 6% are ASL users. 4.6% of Minnesotans have a vision disability who are blind or low vision, and 3.7% of adults have a disability that limits their ability to do hygiene, cleaning, bathing for themselves. 40% of all Minnesotans age 65 and older have a disability, and uh, people of color who also have a, dis a disability are, one, more likely to have a disability, and two, more likely to have even more disproportionate health, educational, and employment outcomes. Our agency is on its 50th anniversary right now, and we are celebrating it and also humbled by the crucial and collaborative work that we do. As I said before, we see ourselves as a host and a connector, bringing the people, and in the truest sense of the word, together with decision makers. Elevating the voice of the people with disabilities to those in power, whether they're commissioners to the governor's office or to legislators, has been a key element to the work that we do. Our agency was created before significant federal legislation was passed, such as the Rehabilitation Act and the Americans with Disabilities Act. During those transitions, the state enterprise relied heavily on our council to help them transition through these uh, new requirements, including affirmative action goals for employment and the, the requirement to continuously reduce and eliminate barriers and services and facilities. The state heavily relied on us and has decreasingly done so over the last several decades. Now we must advocate to find our seat at the table to ensure people with disabilities, voices, and needs are being heard and addressed. Our budget was cut significantly in the mid-2000s, before my time, and we still have not returned to that same level of staffing, which is about half of now what we used to have before. The state enterprise does not and has not always prioritized people with disabilities and compliance to disability laws, which is why an independent state agency that's not under any one administration's oversight is crucial to ensuring the rights of people with disabilities. The promise of the Olmstead Supreme Court decision that people can live in communities of their choice in the least restrictive environment with a true choice to work, live, play, and worship wherever they choose has not yet arrived in Minnesota. So when we need to, we advocate through legislative changes to make improvements in services and rights. We also recognize that different disability groups require specialists and special advocacy groups, and we value and collaborate with them as well. Our agency's motto is your policy training and technical resource, and we do that across the public sector, the private sector, with law enforcement, all three branches of state government, as well as local government entities as well. 
we are a staff of seven people with about a 1.038 or approximately $1 million per fiscal year budget. We are across disability, which means uh, we represent and advocate for folks of all kinds of disabilities and collaborate with advocates. Just to give you an idea uh, of the over 1 million Minnesotans with disabilities that we serve, here's an example of some of the kind of work that we do. We host what's called the Minnesota Disability Action Partnership. This is a collaborative effort by state agencies and the nonprofit advocates to come together to work on finding solutions together. We have a study that had over 1,000 responses into a survey that will come out next month that identifies what state agencies, counties, school districts, and our own agency can do better to improve services for people with disabilities in Minnesota. We advise the Department of Health on data collection and health equities. Just a few specific examples on health inequities for people with disabilities. They are 12% more likely to have diabetes, two times more likely to smoke, and almost four times more likely to have heart disease. We are mentoring a new agency called the Rare Disease Advisory Council. We consult with DHS monthly on the services they offer and the waiver programs and services. We meet with the Minnesota Management and Budgets HR Department to review how they employ, retain, and train ADA coordinators and employees with disabilities throughout the state enterprise. We work with Homeland Security in the state to ensure people with disabilities have adequate and appropriate emergency planning materials people with disabilities are much more likely to be injured or pass away as a result of an emergency. We, have, we sit on several Department of Transportation uh, committees, task forces and groups, the Governor's Workforce Development Board, Minnesota's IT Technology Accessibility Committee, the Metropolitan Council's Technology, uh, Transportation Accessibility Advisory Committee, the Workers' Compensation Home Modification Program for people who are injured on the job site, and require home modifications to continue to live in their home. And it goes on and on from there. We also consult with state agencies, counties, cities, school districts, law enforcement to improve their disability policies for accommodations for their employees, for their students, or for the public that they serve. This includes digital accessibility, such as media and their websites, as well as public meetings to ensure that they have accommodations like ASL interpreters and captioning. One of our employees is not able to be here today, David Fenley, our ADA director. And I wanted to just mention the kind of work that he does before I pass it along to my colleagues here. Uh, the, less, the amount of work that I listed were all things that we do systemically. But every single day, sometimes dozens of times a week, we get contacted by individuals throughout the state of Minnesota that have a personal issue that they need to be addressed, that needs to be addressed in some manner of, you know. And I'm gonna go through just a few examples of the kind of work that he does that can range from a uh, simple email response to someone letting them know. We take a positive kind of, um, if you kind of understood better what was going on, you would do the right thing approach. Very much a, a honey, not vinegar approach in the beginning. <laughs> this responds to uh, job accommodations, service animals, disability parking, disability parking enforcement, specifically uh, when it comes to people uh, shoveling snow into disability parking spaces. Um, ADA and building code guidelines, accessibility for schools. We have many, many old schools in the Twin Cities that are not ADA compliant. Uh, helping people navigate the civil rights complaint process, which is numerous, difficult, and challenging, and varies for each agency. Present disability awareness, disability etiquette, disability training to nonprofits, to the government sectors of all state, local, and county, uh, into the private sector. And um, we receive uh, dozens of these. All in all, we have 21 separate statutory duties outside of our enabling statute that are all unfunded requirements of our agency. We think it's valuable that we're there at the table ensuring that people with disabilities have the rights in consultation for best practices and how we do the work that we do. But it also means that we typically have one person that specializes in one thing and no redundancy for any tasks that they may do across our staff, as you can imagine, with a staff of seven. Um, and then just lastly, some recent changes that occurred as a result of the pandemic. Um, oh, one, one, one note I want to add is that 90% of corporations now have a kind of racial or ethnic cultural DEI initiative, which is wonderful. But according to Time, the magazine company, only 4% have one relating to disability inclusion in their workplace. Uh, and it's not an either or uh, proposition, but an and, that uh, how can someone be included if they don't have access to that facility, to that location, to services, 
as an employee or as a consumer of that company. So there are some social and cultural issues that we experience as well that we try to work on. Um, COVID-19 was obviously a global pandemic that not only created a new disability category, long COVID, but it also brought a ton of attention to the disparate health results for people with disabilities in Minnesota and nationally. So uh, our agency quickly shifted from what I just explained as our normal tasks that we do to being heavily involved with the COVID-19 response for our state, ensuring people with disabilities and their care providers received adequate PPE, uh, immunizations, and treatment. And we worked with the state at the State Emergency Operations Center as a disability policy advisor to ensure all the executive orders and implementations of vaccine buses, et cetera, were all accessible and legally uh, followed the Americans with Disabilities Act, but as well as the Human Rights Act in Minnesota, almost all at our own agency's expense. The number of collaborations and consultations that the governor's office and state agencies needed during the pandemic to ensure their services were accessible and followed legal requirements began to skyrocket. We experienced a significant uh, amount of requests for consultation for emergency preparedness. And we continue to build on these valuable relationships, but that also means that our technical advisement uh, and expertise it continues to be in high demand. But we also want it to be. We want to ensure that folks with disabilities are at the table, that their rights are observed and recognized, and people, and they have access to all the public services that everyone else does. Uh, as an aside, our employees work tremendously hard. They have a heart like people who work in the nonprofit sector than the service that they do. Uh, they are part of the disability communities of Minnesota themselves and put in significant amount of overtime to accomplish the systemic changes that I've discussed earlier. So uh, as the executive director, I'm very thankful for a committed and caring staff. Um, up next, I'd like to uh, welcome Linda Gremion to share about our operations and I'll also hold for any questions. Thank you. Yeah, if you can just hold off uh, on Linda. Um, members, uh, the, the one of the things that, that uh, Dave Dively and, and his group had put together was a couple of years ago when we looked at people with disabilities, um, Governor Dayton had put in a, a benchmark and said he wanted to see more people with disabilities working in state government. And, and, and prior to that, there was a Pathways to Employment. Do you guys remember that one years ago? <clears throat> and they spent time and they put all this money in place and over a 10-year period. And when they started, um, the amount of people with disabilities that worked in state government was like 3.6%. I might be off by a couple. And correct about me. two. 3.2? No, about 2%. 2%. When it, at the end of it, instead of it going up, it actually went down. Um, and so they spent this time, and it wasn't these guys who did it, but it was, you know, it was, so the, the, uh, the appetite was good. It was sent out there. And then when Connect 700 was, was put in place, which uh, I think, um, there was a task force that uh, I believe Tori Westrom uh, headed that task force up. Trevor, is that correct? Uh, yeah, Legis he had the legislation, and then Trevor handed up the, the task force was done through this group. And, and what they found was some systemic things within our own state agencies ac across the board, that uh, things that could have been fixed. And, and here's the one unique thing, Dave Diley, that came out of this is um, you mentioned the ADA. Uh, the, the, the gentleman who wrote the ADA, his name was Bobby Silverstein, and he passed away this year. But he also, he was Tom Harkins, he was the help committee's uh, lawyer, and he also wrote Public Law 99457, which I think is a better piece of uh, his writing stability. I mean, he did a great job on that. But he contacted us and said, the metrics that you put in place for this Connect 700 were spot on. How it was managed was dis, was disenfranchised. It was dis, it was really fragmented, and because of that, there was no consistency. And so, out of that work group, this Connect 700 bill was was um, was developed last year. It passed the House. Uh, then senators, now you guys were House members, uh, I believe, <laughs> Elise Mann and and Rasmussen. You were not. You were gone by then. But that was that passed the House. It went through and, and did its thing, and, and it got held up in the Senate. Um, kind of talk about, I mean, you, you mentioned the ADA and you, and you mentioned that, but it's it, to get to where if, if we truly want to see that happen, I mean, some of the barriers that were there, you as a state agency with seven people help the larger agencies understand what their rights, roles, and obligations are under, and, and I'll give an example, 1974, you know, the Rehabilitation Act of 1974 establishes that you can't discriminate, right? Mm -hmm. Simple. 
should be done. Um, but but I just wanted to highlight to members in this committee, I see that as a priority, that that Connect 700 bill, and, and there's some other ones that you have listed in here, but before, before you go to Linda, I just wanted to get that highlighted out there that the the, uh, the work that, that this uh, agency did to bring forward those issues and to highlight that there's a better way that we can do business as a state, um, I think needs to be done this year. And so uh, any questions from anybody? Anybody want to go into the weeds on Connect 700 or not? No? We're good. All right. Um, Mr. Dively, you're going to give it to Linda. Ms. Linda. Hi. Thank you, uh, Chair Hoffman and members of the committee for inviting MCD here today. Um, my talk will be a little bit kind of like a day in the life of the operations director at MCD. And we often don't get a chance to testify so from the operational side, so this is kind of fun. Uh, my name is Linda Grimion. I'm the operations director of the Minnesota Council on Disability. I've been with the council since 20, uh, 2004 after a 15-year career at MnDOT. I'm a white woman with long hair tied up in a clip wearing a white sweater sitting in a hearing room in the Senate office building. I identify as a woman with several disabilities. I'm proud and affirmed to work at an agency where my disability is celebrated and accommodated. My accommodations rarely cost money. Most accommodations, or many, are those of the soul rather than of the pocketbook. As my colleague David Dively mentioned, the council has been around since 1973. In the late 80s and early 90s, agency staff, along with council members and a coalition of the disability, participated in writing the Americans with Disabilities Act, contributing, uh, advising Senators Durenberger and Harkin and on the committee you spoke of, Senator Hoffman. We proudly sent a delegation to the White House lawn to celebrate the signing of the ADA. And as recently as 2015, for the 25th anniversary of the ADA, we came full circle when we brought Senator Tom Harkin back to Minnesota to talk about jobs, jobs, jobs. <laughs> Before that, in the 70s, our staff, along with strong participation of council members, planned, developed, and ensured implementation of then non-existent curb cuts, for example, or paratransit vehicles with lifts. We um, participated in bringing forth power door openers of the state capitol, MCD. The most, at the time, accessible sports stadium, go twins, <laughs> in the United States, MCD. And then every stadium in Minnesota after that. The nation often looks to Minnesota for the lead, and in the case of accessible stadiums, MCD. At the table codifying accessible building code into law, MCD. Now we didn't do any of this in a vacuum, uh, we've always engaged our state disability partners, nonprofits, and state agencies alike. This past summer at the state fair, this goes a little bit to the why, I chatted with a legislator who stopped by our booth in the education building. She commented, wow, you have everything here. Yep, we partner with all state agencies and a few nonprofits that have a disability mission or lens. We offer partners space and support to present a united disability front. It's all here for everyone, and people love it. Ask anyone. The, we have the coolest booth at the, state, at the education building at the State Fair. She said, I don't think I've ever seen a state agency partnership like this. Teachers come to our booth in droves. It's the only place, the only place they can get funky, cool, educationally valuable art for their classroom for, by, and about people with disabilities. I showed another legislator who stopped in for her chance to chat up the disability community at our What Does Disability Pride Mean to You board. It's a board with a cutout of the ADA. Everybody writes on post-it notes, and the notes literally fill up our entire state fair booth. It overflows all over the place, and people want and need a place to belong to their government, even if it's a post-it note. She reads the notes, looking stunned, affected, moved, and said, I want a cloud, a word cloud of all these answers. Because apparently, equality, safety, no stigma, acceptance, meaningful lives, equal rights, survival, not easy, being unapologetic, kindness, health equity, school inclusion, equal representation, having dignity, Freedom, my child, fearless, no shame, no pity, 
family, power, wholeness, and love mean something. Hey, stop by our booth at the 2023 fair. This is gonna be the new poster. It'll look great in your office walls. So how the sausage is made. The MCD budget has two budget categories, programs by way of staffing, approximately 59% of our allotted funds. The remaining 41% is operations, you know, the space, rental, IT, workplace accommodations, council expenses, contracts, communications and printed materials, meeting production, et cetera. For an agency with 7.5 uh, FTEs with a 1.2 FTE vacancy rate, by the way, many state agencies are experiencing challenges to filling open positions. Shameless plug, hiring people with disabilities is a key solution. My position as the operations director intersects every aspect of the agency. For without the stuff to do the work we, to, to do the work, tech, office space, you know, the box of brochures in braille and large print in the basement that you pull out for the state fair, all have an operational aspect. And for us council-based agencies, we also support a citizen-run council onboarding private citizens to the ways of government. It's never what they think it is. <laughs> and as a state agency, all of this must be done in a compliant way. The operational side of the Minnesota Council on Disability performs all the duties required of all state agencies to comply with the state of Minnesota operational standards, often statutory. We get transactional support from SMART, the SMART program, the admin small agency resource team, which doesn't include the professional side of operations. Make no mistake, we absolutely could not survive without the support of SMART. For instance, MCD writes the biennial budget documents, SMART loads them into the system that MMB uses. Agencies such as MnDOT or DNR or Corrections might have a unit of employees to procure contracts, manage vendor performance, deliverables, and services, and, if needed, issue and score and award an RFP. Small agencies such as MCD have one person, me. That same person, me, processes all the grant activities. At Corrections, it's likely several employees share the duties to write position descriptions. Here, just one very, business, very busy business operations director, who also interfaces with Minute, sometimes for months to resolve IT issues, and you all know working with Minute is a journey. I financially open and close the accounting processes for each fiscal year. I'm known by the smart staff as take it to the limit Linda because I don't leave a dime on the table. Our budget dollars are so, do so much and are so tight, I've been known to slide it to the end of the biennium with less than 500 bucks. <laughs> Not one penny goes to waste. And just to prove I'm a magician, I also manage our communications activities, including when we are financially able to produce video content. In my spare time, I dance on the head of a pin to advocate for change in a digitally inaccessible environment to make state processes accessible to all. Just yesterday, 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 I was in a statewide meeting and was reminded that many state employees with disabilities do not claim their business expenses because the system is inaccessible. So they just gift that money back to the state. That was yesterday, yesterday. The vendor system is also not fully accessible, which puts some business owners with disabilities at a disadvantage. You can't compete if you're not in the digital room. On the rare occasion I receive an accessible process document or process from an internal partner, we have a party, which I procure according to the state of Minnesota special expense policy. That's tongue in cheek. Because when the enterprise gets it right, and the employment and contracting environment for people with disabilities improves. You might wonder how this gets done in a 40 hour week. You know it doesn't. Folks in small agencies regularly put in extra hours because the work is that important and the staffing constraints are that tight. Lots of salaried state employees do just that. We're not the only ones. But I'm telling you, when I see a state colleague understand the reason to make the process or document accessible so that employees that work in my agency can access the same thing they take for granted every single day, and they understand that improving processes improves the employment and contracting landscape for the disability community, that's a good day. 
when I can assist a new state agency, such as the Rare Disease Advisory Council on how to operate as a small agency, or when I've produced an important story with a person with a disability and they tell me, this is the honor of my lifetime to be celebrated for, for having a disability. Well, Senator Hoffman, you asked why? There's nothing like it. Who's honored? I'm honored. I'm thankful David and Trevor invited me here today to talk about operations. Thanks for taking the time to learn about us at the Council on Disability. Senator May Quaid. Thank you, Senator, or, or Chair Hoffman, excuse me. Um, and I want to thank you all for, for appearing here. Um, I'm going to model what has been demonstrated to the us. I have long brown hair. I'm wearing a light pink shirt. I have black glasses on and red lipstick. Um, because we have the council in front of us, I think it's really important for us to learn some of these things that make it easier for Minnesotans to tune into committees. Closed captioning and video, obviously, um, auditory descriptions. I would love to know if there are other things that we can do to make this committee and all committees, but particularly this committee, more accessible. Uh, Ms. Linda, Dave, Trevor, who wants to go? I think Dave is good. This is David Dively speaking. Um, that's one thing. Uh, now most... Uh, Committee members uh, are, are called by name and before they speak, so they, that's less of an issue. But for meetings, that can be a common concern, especially with sign language interpreters, is that they don't know who is speaking, so it's hard to refer to that individual. Uh, obviously, there was the task force that the Legislative Coordinating Commission put uh, out to study what it would take to make the legislature a more accessible environment, and that study will be, um, results will be shared soon. We did participate in that. Um, uh, basically, um, and, and this has improved a bit since uh, over the years, but um, having uh, captioning out in the hallways of the Senate building in the hearing rooms, we have it on the screen here, which is lovely, so I can use it. But as we were watching uh, the previous uh, committee hearing about uh, menstrual products in schools, the captioning was not on in the lobby. So that meant, in this case, there's no audio. So literally no one could follow what was happening, uh, even if they didn't have a disability. Um, and uh, so that, that's one part, but then it goes to electronic accessibility. So having captions uh, in our, our video channel streaming services, making it really clear to people how they can request accommodations if they need captioning or ASO interpreters. Having handouts that are, can be available in braille or large print for people with, with vision disabilities. Um, the whole legislative website is could, could use improvements in terms of navigating and tracking a bill as it goes in and then how it gets into an omnibus bill, and then how it's tracked in a spreadsheet. Uh, the budget spreadsheets are entirely inaccessible for someone who uses a screen reader. So there are there are numerous uh, points at which, um, and these are documented in that study, that, that things could be improved. The one thing that this committee could do, and I think as a model, would be um, to ensure that the documents or handouts that are included in the agendas are accessible. Um, so people who want to read a copy online or uh, read remarks after the fact, could, with a screen reader or with their uh, assistive technology, read those documents or review that PowerPoint or slideshow, things like that. And then, um, which has become a trend now, is to have a centralized a kind of accessibility coordinator who is in charge of managing requests for accommodations. And that also includes the legislative staff, senators in, in this case, uh, and uh, constituents in public as well. Um, and there's, there's more that I could go on, but that might be a start there. I think you should keep going on. Um, thank you for asking that question, Senator May Quaid. You want to follow up with it? It's uh, um, that's lots, and and it just really you know when you talk about an accessibility coordinator, I, I think within the Connect Seven Hundred, we talked about ADA coordinator, accessibility coordinator. We talked about closing that gap, right? And I don't know who is going to be the chief author of the bill. I know Rep. Ryer has it over in the mm -hmm. House. I don't know who. Somebody from this committee should grab it and, and get it to state and local government and pass it right away and um, get it done, right? I mean, that clearly shows, and there was a, uh, there's not much cost to that bill, if I remember right. Um, and, and if it would help get into that process, uh, you know, you take for granted, like out in the hallway, you take for granted, what, what you just highlighted was that that's not an accessible way to, to view something. And so I don't know who has jurisdiction over that. Members, do, <laughs> do we, <laughs> Senator May Quaid, we got a lawyer, a couple of lawyers on there. Senator May Quaid, who's got that? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, 
testifiers, I was actually uh, chairing the committee at the time and, and received a really helpful note to let us know that the captions weren't on. So it's, it's to the discretion of the chair um, and then whoever's running the, uh, the video for the Zoom. So that would be under the chair's purview. And I appreciated someone letting us know, but that's something I should have caught as the chair at the time. So uh, like the TVs out in the hallway too, is that is that for us to tell somebody in Senate meeting? Let's see, I just learned something here today. And if you don't mind. Go ahead. The uh, Legislative Coordinating Commission uh, handles the procurement and services for that, paid through the Public Utilities Commission's Telecommunication Access Minnesota funding to pay for the captioning services that the legislature, both chambers and the Capitol uses. And it is currently the state's practice that the whole capital complex of all televisions and lobbies be captioned. Uh, implementation is mixed, but uh, is is according to the, the rules and practices uh, for our legislative branch. Interesting. So Public Utilities Commission handles that, and that's through? Just the finances. The energy, the energy Committee would have that? The small phone fee on everyone's cell phone bill of about six or seven cents pays for numerous things, one of which is the captioning services for the legislative branch. Well, I think if we had the lead of the energy committee on this committee, maybe you could maybe bring that up to, so wait a minute, Senator Matthews. <laughs> uh, this is good stuff, isn't it? It is good. So thank you. Trevor, you want to take us through uh, what you got going on or, um, and then, um, then we just keep the conversation going. So yes, thank Turner, you, Chair welcome. Hoffman. Yeah, thank you, Chair Hoffman. Uh, my name is Trevor Turner, and I'm the Public Policy Director for the Minnesota Council on Disability. Um, I'm also uh, an adult with a disability. I have a condition called Usher Syndrome, which is a genetic condition that manifests itself as uh, severe hearing loss, and uh, which I wear hearing aids for, and also progressive blindness, which means that I'm losing my vision over time. So as someone with progressive blindness, I really appreciate the audio description. So I will go ahead and give mine. And, you know, I am a white male um, wearing a blue shirt or a blue suit and a uh, purple shirt and tie. I'm blonde hair and blue eyed. Um, you know, I, now Kevin asked me on Friday uh, if we would be willing to do this uh, hearing. I was really excited and I knew that I couldn't do it alone. Uh, so I'm really happy to have our staff here, uh, some of our staff here. Um, you know, Linda, she asked me if what we should say, and I said, just be Linda. And so I'm glad you were exactly who you are, and you gave a great <laughs> speech. And then, you know, David, with this encyclopedic knowledge about everything, which is really helpful. Um, and, of course, Nikki, uh, her leadership as elected official herself, it's really awesome to have her here as well. Um, as the public policy director, you know, there's four uh, statutory mandates that guide our public policy. Um, the first one is to advise and otherwise aid the governor, appropriate state agencies, the state legislature, and the public on matters pertaining to public policy and the administration of programs, services, and facilities for persons who have a disability in Minnesota. And it's a very broad, broad mandate, um, and, it, and it's quite a lot to digest and take in and do, but, you know, one of my favorite things to do as the public policy director is to work with our constituents, work with people with disabilities who want to make a difference in Minnesota. Um, for example, and we have, for example, we have Damon Livestad, who we worked with Senator Abler, who um, I believe is here virtually, um, but we worked with his office to draft a bill. Um, Damon had tons of ideas about the PCA workforce shortage. And so I worked with him, worked with the revisor's office through Senator Abler, and we're able to draft three bills um, that we are hoping to introduce this session uh, that help address the workforce shortage. Um, and it's stuff like that that really um, make this job worthwhile. Um, I started this job in 2020 uh, in the midst of the pandemic, so I had to learn how to do the job virtually. So it feels great to be here um, in person and see you all in uh, faces and not in a square box. Um, and, but it still was, I learned a lot in the last few years and that is, you know, working with our constituents is really what makes the difference and that people with disabilities really are the, big, the biggest knowledge base of how to um, uh, make change and make a place more accessible. Um, you know, we say that nothing about us without us when it comes to policy because, and I believe that because it is really people with disabilities who are innovators out of necessity 
um, are really good at finding policy solutions. So I always ask, you know, our elected officials, when you're looking for policy solutions for problems, look for people with disabilities because we're the ones that have to live this every day and we know um, the best solutions for our issues that we're working on. Um, our second uh, our second guiding mandate is to serve as a source of information to the public to the public regarding all services, program, and legislation pertaining to a person with disability. And so we do this by we just have a online bill tracking uh, website. So I track every single disability related bill that comes through the House and the Senate, and we post it online. Um, which you know this session, I think I've heard that over two thousand bills have been dropped into the hopper and more even today. Um, and so it's, it, it's a lot of bills to digest and there's a lot of um, disability related things. And, and as Senator Hoffman was saying earlier, the disability is intersectional. So there are certain bills that are obviously directly related to people with disabilities, but there are a lot of other bills that have a strong impact on people with disabilities whether it's you know uh, anti-bullying legislation or um, voting rights, things like that, they all have a strong impact on people with disabilities. Um, and then every year we have our annual legislative forum, which some of you have participated in with us, and we appreciate that. And that is an opportunity for us to bring our elected officials um, and the public together to talk about disability issues and to introduce our legislative agenda. Um, the third mandate we have is to review and make comment to the governor, state agencies, the legislature, and the public concerning the adequacy of state programs, plans, and budgets for services to persons with disability and for funding under the various federal grants program. And we do this through testifying uh, on legislation. We do this through uh, letters of support. Um, we have regular meetings with the governor's office and state agencies and, and legislators like all, you all. Um, and we take position papers as well. And we also serve on task force and advisory committees as well. And unfortunately, our colleague David Fenley is not here today, um, but he actually chaired the task force for the employment and retention of employees with disabilities. And that's what Senator Hoffman was referring to earlier. And spent two years uh, you know, evaluating the Connect 700 program and how the state employs and retains people with disabilities. And unfortunately, you know, it, it was lacking, and, but we hope to change that. And that is something that we are working on. As, as Senator Hoffman said, uh, the Connect 700 program, we have a bill. Sen uh, Representative Ryard is, um, is the author in the Senate, or in the House, um, and we're hoping to find a Senate author to do that. Last year it was Senator Westrom, and we hope to continue that forward. Uh, this is the third year that we've been put this legislation forward. So we're hoping that this is the year that we get it done. And this bill would improve the employment and retention of people with disabilities by reforming the Connect 700 program, um, and standardizing uh, ADA coordinators across state agencies, um, and then also better tracking disability data for employees with disabilities at the state. Um, the final- Can I just um, say something, Trevor, there? Yeah. You mentioned that, and, and, and out of the work that you had done, and members, you, you, you'd think, um, name one state agency that, 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 that did the best when it came to reasonable accommodations, and, and it was the Department of Transportation. Mm -hmm. Out of 599 reasonable requests for accommodations, they accommodated 598, right? Mm -hmm. it just, but the fact is that they were front and center, and I, and I would hear when then it was uh, uh, Margaret Kelleher was the, was the, um, the director or whatever, commissioner of it, but that I, your study, your, the work that you'd done, it showed that how state agencies were doing, and then some of the anecdotal stories of just where it was just this, not a very concentrated, consistent way of looking at one, one person, members, one person, reasonable accommodation, lives with autism, and um, there was a presentation in front of a, a group of people. She wanted to be able to sit in the front row and to watch the PowerPoint on her, on her computer, right? Honest to God, the agency that was involved at the time said no, because you're probably going to be on Facebook was the comment that came out of that. Actually, that person was fired from that job. Um, I mean, that's the kind of, you know, it was a simple, reasonable accommodation, and, and I'm not going to get into the nuances, but it just kind of burns 
really burns me wrong with that. And I just didn't mean to cut you off, Trevor, but I wanted to just highlight that point that you, you had good data in there and you have this great bill. It's just, you know, uh, we just need to finish the job over here in the Senate on that. So continue. Absolutely. It, and that actually is a great segue into my next topic was talking about our public policy agenda. So one of the responsibilities I have is crafting our public policy agenda every year for each legislative session. And one of our top priorities this year is the employment and retention of employees with disabilities bill. Um, and so, and that comes about from the recommendations from our task force, um, which we get, but also guiding our public policy agenda. Uh, we have meetings with constituents, hundreds and hundreds of meetings, if not thousands of meetings with uh, people with disabilities across the state in greater Minnesota and the Twin Cities metro area. Um, talking about issues ranging from transportation to education um, to health care um, to uh, employment. Uh, it's a very broad uh, scope of what disability issues contain. And we, that is something that we really, really value is all that input from our constituent. That's the number one uh, uh, thing that helped build our legislative agenda is the issues that constituents bring to us. Um, we also meet with legislators and legislators who want to um, bring forward a disability-related bill, um, and so that will help guide our legislative agenda as well. Um, we get ideas and feedback from council members, um, and we also, who our council members represent all of Minnesota. Um, and then, of course, we get feedback from the community. Um, this year, we did a survey and got over 300 responses um, at the state fair. Um, and that helped build our agenda as well. Um, the things that we've worked on, you know, one of the things I would like to talk about is our partnerships with other organizations and state agencies. Um, you know, another a deaf blind advocate that many people are familiar with is Helen Keller. And she said, you know, um, alone we can do so little, but together we can do so much. And I really believe that. I think it's a really great mantra to uh, live by because, um, you know, we work with the DNR to um, have accessible state parks, which include bringing in the track share program, which made news across Minnesota. Um, yep. And then um, we work with the Department of Labor and Industry to make sure our building code is uh, up to standard and that we uh, are making sure our buildings are accessible for everyone, including our stadiums. Um, and then we also work on autonomous vehicles, which concludes the Go Marty program uh, in Grand Rapids, Minnesota. Go Marty is the Minnesota Autonomous Rural Transit Initiative, which is autonomous vehicles that help people with disabilities get around in small towns in Minnesota. Um, and it was a really awesome program. Uh, David was able to go up there and watch it, and um, Senator Klobuchar was there. It's a really cool program, and we're hoping to do more stuff like that. Um, one of the things that I'm uh, most proud of in the 2020 session, or 2021 legislative session is passing an interactive process bill. So this was an amendment to the Minnesota Human Rights Act that would guarantee workplace accommodations for employees with disabilities. Um, it was really surprising that the Minnesota Human Rights Act didn't have that in there already, but um, you know, it's because the Minnesota Human Rights Act predates the ADA. Um, Minnesota Human Rights Act was passed in 1973, which is the same year that the Minnesota Council on Disability was passed. Um, so that one of the things that I'm most proud of Minnesota for is being a leader and a, a progressive leader on disability issues, um, including helping get the ADA passed. And so um, it was great to be able to help improve the Minnesota Human Rights Act, which was already such a great piece of legislation um, and then another thing we did was we worked on creating the Rare Disease Advisory Council. You know, as someone who has a rare disease, Usher syndrome, um, it really meant a lot to me to be able to create a council that approaches rare diseases holistically, not just treating it as a medical condition or clinical trials or anything like that, that people with rare diseases you know, have jobs, they need to travel, they have health care, they have uh, their school, their students. And so having a council that will approach rare diseases holistically is something that uh, really means a lot to me. So, um, Mr. Turner, yeah. the Rare Disease Council, how you're, you helped create it, so it sits underneath the umbrella of the 
the Disability Council. Is that correct? I think, Linda, you can help me better with that question. And, and I know we're, we're at, it's five after four, and I got, you know, I don't want to dip into Bud Rosenfeld's time, you know, because mm -hmm. we're going to get serious about some legal stuff here in a couple yeah. minutes. Um, the Rare Disease Advisory Council is its own state agency, but we're statutorily obligated to mentor them into their operations. See, okay, so I thank you for that. And, and this is where maybe um, Senator Wicklin and Liam and folks that the Rare Disease Council sits in the jurisdiction of Senator Wicklin, yet it sits underneath your operational side of it, and your jurisdiction fits in this committee. So. I just, that's, we'll, we can talk more about that next week or, or Monday, but um, why don't you finish up, Trevor, and then we can uh, get uh, Bud up here. Is that fair? Absolutely, yeah. Right. The, the final thing I just wanted to talk about was our 2023 legislative agenda, which fortunately we provided in your handouts today. Yep. So please go ahead and um, review it, and if you have any questions, you can reach out to me at any time. Um, send me an email or give me a call, and I'd be happy to work with you on that. Members, okay. any questions for... I just want to thank you guys. You know the the um, how important it is that you exist uh, within the state agency to to provide the technical assistance uh, is beyond. Uh, you know, you, you look at this building. You look at you know the the advocates that got to you that got to the state. Rick Cardenas. If it wasn't for Rick Cardenas, we wouldn't have a barrier free entrance into the Capitol front lawn, right? I mean, that was. Uh, and I always say we need another Rick Cardenas in this in this world. So, um, members, Senator Wickland. Thank you, Senator Hoffman. Uh, I was wondering, Trevor, you, you mentioned that you do a, a bill tracker during session. Is that something that you do you email out to people, or is it on your website that we could access it if we go there on a regular basis? Yep, it's on our website. So we have an internal spreadsheet that we use, and then I convert that over to our website with our help of our digital accessibility coordinator, Chad. Um, and so it's on the website right now, um, and we update it weekly. Okay, thank you. I didn't, I didn't know that either, Senator Wicklin. So I want that too. So anybody else want that from Trevor? Any questions? Um, final thoughts, Dave? You want to, uh, we're good? Uh, this is David Daly speaking. Yeah, thank you all members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to share uh, about the work that we do. And I, I hope that you heard the, a lot of the, the why in our hearts and our words about why this work is so important to us personally and professionally. And um, again, thank you for being on this committee, which has such a tremendous impact uh, every day to people all around the state. Um, and so with that, um, thank you very much for letting us uh, share with you today. Thank you. Hey, um, uh, coming up, thank you very much. Uh, and you will get a hold of us contact information. You'll do the rounds to folks, right? Trevor, thank you. Barnett, Bud Rosenfeld. You know, I, I have I've all these years to, to know who Bud Rosenfeld is. I, I, I never knew the first name of Barnett until somebody called me and, and said your name, and I went, Barnett? Who's that? Bud. Mr. Rosenfeld, thank you for coming here to uh, educate us on the Office of Ombudsman for Mental Health and Developmental Disabilities and why you do what you do. So thank you for being here, Mr. Rosenfeld. Thank you, Chair Hoffman. Uh, members, I'll, I'll have to correct you right off the bat, though, because my, my official title is Ombudsman. I'm not a commissioner. I'll explain what the differences are in a, in a moment or two. But I, I do appreciate uh, you all inviting us here, the, the council and, and my agency as well, uh, to give you an overview of what kind of work we do and why we do that work. Um, I am Bud Rosenfield. I'm the uh, Ombudsman for Mental Health and Developmental Disabilities. I am a white male, dark hair, dark eyes. I am wearing a gray sport coat, a blue vest, a tie. Um, and again, I'm happy to be here. Um, I have a presentation for you. Uh, this is, uh, we do a, an overview for a variety of our stakeholders. Um, it usually takes about 45 minutes to an hour. I've tried to cut it down today, uh, and I'll, I'll try not to compensate for that by talking faster than I normally do. But uh, if you have questions as I go, feel free to interrupt me. If you want to hold them till the end, that's fine too. Um, I, I see this as being an opportunity for a dialogue and not just for me to talk for 30 and, minutes straight. And I'm glad you said that, Bud, because this should be a dialogue, really. People, we want to highlight what you do and, and how you're doing it and why you do it for this committee so that as we're going through the, the next few months that uh, your front and topic about what you're doing is important and why. Sure. 
Thank you, Chair, members. Uh, well, let's get into it. So um, one of the first barriers I think that our clients have, if I can make sure this is working here. Uh, you know, don't feel there alone is. on this because I couldn't even get a video to work that, you know, <laughs> it was a minute video, so go ahead. Well, I'm, I'm aiming for a slightly higher level of uh, technological confidence here, perhaps, uh, Chair, than, 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 uh, than I normally show. But um, as I was saying, one of the problems that I think people have just in accessing our offices and services is the very term ombudsman. Most people don't have a clue of what it means. It's, as I understand it, a word, a uh, Swedish word, or at least a Swedish derivation. So in that sense, I suppose it's a, it's a great term for Minnesotans to use. But it is a defined uh, concept. There, there is a, an organization, a national organization, the United States Ombudsman's Association, which defines it as you see up here on this slide. And it hits on the key points for an ombudsman's position in office to, to uh, to have, and that is that it be an independent, impartial, public official with the authority and responsibility to handle complaints, to get those complaints, to respond to complaints by investigating them either formally or informally. Um, and they're usually complaints about both the governmental action and the action of governmentally regulated entities. Uh, and then to act on those complaints in an appropriate fashion. It could be uh, making findings and issuing informal or formal recommendations. It can be issuing public reports. Um, and those are all functions that our office uh, can do and has historically done. But let's get into the details of how our office does this specifically within the scope of our statutory mission and, and purpose. Uh, a little bit of background about OMHDD, and that's the Office of Ombudsman for Mental Health and Developmental Disabilities. We were created in 1987. Uh, it was an offshoot of or component piece of a settlement and consent decree of class action litigation that was brought in the early 70s uh, by my actual uh, former employer, Legal Aid, on behalf of individuals who were living in the state's uh, regional treatment centers. Uh, and it was a lawsuit against the then Department of Public Welfare, now DHS. And it focused on what were really deplorable conditions, living conditions for those individuals, and a complete lack of individualized treatment for people living in those facilities. Uh, as a part of the ultimate settlement and consent decree, among other things, the state committed to apply at that time in the early 80s uh, for the HCBS waiver programs, which were newly created by the federal government at that time. But they also decided that the need for better monitoring for complaint uh, receipt and investigation and action for basic advocacy for people receiving uh, services needed to be done more independently. It had theoretically been housed um, in DHS, but they pulled that function out and they created an independent state agency to handle those types of complaints and provide that kind of advocacy, and that's my agency. Um, so we are an independent state agency. We are not even administratively housed within another entity like Department of Administration. We are a standalone small agency, much like the council is. Uh, we also use SMART, thankfully, and we have them available for our financial and human resources support. Um, as for my position specifically, I am appointed by the governor. I do not have a specific term limit. I am explicitly expected to be nonpartisan. Um, and in that sense, I do differ from, say, the head of a cabinet agency, a commissioner kind of position. Um, our mission and our policy is set by you. It's legislatively created. Um, we are, sometimes I like to uh, describe what we do by what we don't do to people. We are not a regulatory entity. We're not licensing. We're not a law enforcement entity. We're not the police. Uh, we're not a law office, so if you bring a complaint to us and you want to sue somebody or some entity or some agency, that's something that we might help you find uh, somebody to handle, but it's, it's not what we do. What we do do is uh, provide information and assistance, advice, advocacy and assistance, ultimately to, do what a, uh, to perform the function of what an ombudsman's office is created to do, and that is to hold government accountable, make sure that governmental programs and services work the way we intend them to work, that they're available for the people who are supposed to be able to use and access those services in a timely, appropriate, effective way, uh, and make sure that their services are provided equitably, um, and make sure that they are provided in a way that respects the dignity of the individuals who receive those services uh, and upholds their rights. That's the primary focus of an ombudsman's office. We divide our staff and our work into two basic groups. We have uh, regional ombudsmen, 10 regional ombudsmen, who are uh, located around the state, and we divide the state up into regions, in part as a response to the uh, reason for creating our office. There were regional treatment centers around the state, so we had an ombudsman in every region of the state where there was a regional treatment center or a state-run nursing facility. Those treatment centers have uh, 
for the most part, closed over time for, for a variety of good reasons. We still have the specialty one in Anoka, the Anoka Metro uh, Regional Treatment Center, and we still have the forensic mental health program down in St. Peter. And we have, we have regional staff who oversee those programs. Um, this is our mission statement. If, for those of you who, know, who don't just like to uh, make the law but want to read it occasionally, you have our statutory uh, site there, section 245.92, and it says that we exist to do this, promote the highest attainable standards. And I focus on that phrase for good reason. We're not interested in helping, in helping people access uh, subsistence level or basic um, uh, compliance level services. Our mission is to help push the edge of the envelope. It's to help improve programs and to frankly to shoot for the moon, uh, to make our programs and services work and function as best as they possibly can to meet people's needs as they best, as they best can. Um, so the highest attainable standards of treatment, competence, efficiency, and justice for persons, and now, now you, you start to see the definition of our, or the scope of our uh, services, the who. This is the, these are the uh, categories of people who we are set up to serve. Persons receiving services for mental health, developmental disabilities, and that's, those two are relatively obvious from the, the title of my position and agency, but also chemical dependency or emotional disturbance. Those are our client groups. So the people we serve, they are people who fall into those uh, broad disability categories, who receive services uh, that address those, uh, their disabilities and chronic health conditions in those, in those areas. And they specifically are people receiving services from um, statutorily defined agencies, facilities, and programs. I'll get to what those mean because it, it's the second filter that helps to define the scope of our work. Um, but I want to point out that we do provide services and support and assistance to both children and adults. Um, and that for purposes of contacting our office, it doesn't have to be the person who has the disability and who's receiving services, although we are frequently contacted by individuals. Hey, it, bud. Yeah. So Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, you look at the Minnesota's concerns, the services, and I, I knew this. And so one of the other conversations that came under jurisdictions is the substance use mental health, um, when you talk to it, to, to folks, they should be. You should be looking at that from a systems viewpoint, and and, and it clearly is evident that you uh, deal with those ombudsman's concerns under mental health, mental disabilities, chemical dependency. So, the grants, for example, the mental health grants, right? Where because I, I'm, I believe your agency has been underfunded for many, many years, and there's there's I know the need is there. It's huge. It's gigantic, especially as you look at the projection of how many people that are living uh, with mental health and substance use, right? Then you talk to a talk to a sheriff that runs a jail, and he'll tell you 70 to 75 percent of the people that are in, in custody are, are co-occurring conditions. You know, the Wilder Foundation does these reports, and it's to me it's, it's front and center, um, but it's just really um, frustrating that that isn't front and center for a, a lot of folks out there. And I don't know why that is, but that's, I can't control that, but we can find a way to do it. But my question to you is this. Um, on the funding side of it, do you currently get any grant money under mental health, or are you just given your appropriation and that's it? We're, uh, the vast majority of our funding is the appropriation. We get a small amount to work with the University of Minnesota's psychiatry clinical trials. That's it. Okay, thank you for that, uh, Mr. Roosevelt. Here's again it, it, another another dilemma for me when you got operational side under one jurisdiction and some extra funding under another one. It's like, okay, I just I, I thank you for that answer. So keep going. Sure, thank you, Chair. Members, um, I think I was just emphasizing that it's uh, we we oftentimes are contacted by a variety of uh, individuals or stakeholders on behalf of our client clients and client populations. Um, so we're not limited to only speaking uh, in, uh, with, in sort of one path. Uh, it could be that we get contacted by family members, uh, legal representatives like guardians. We might get contacted by service providers, case managers. Um, we might get contacted by other members or other employees of uh, local agencies or by state agencies on, on issues related to our clients. Uh, however we get contacted, whatever the questions and issues are that are posed to us, if, we, if and when we do provide client-specific advocacy, we do so on behalf of the person with the, uh, with the disability who's receiving services or trying to access services uh, uh, related to their disability. We don't represent the case manager. We don't represent the provider. We don't represent even mom or dad or the guardian. We represent the individual. That's what we're set up to do. Um, I mentioned that part of the way the scope of our work is defined is, is this uh, terminology used in our statute, agency, facility, or program. 
But there are some basic points here to tease that out. We, we work on issues that arise under the aegis of three state agencies, human services, health, and education. But as you all know, human services might create a program, they might regulate that program, they might fund services under that program. They don't necessarily um, do the day-to-day -day administration of that program. They don't provide the services under that program. Every part of the system that operates under that umbrella, though, the lead agencies, the counties and tribes that, are, that do the day-to-day -day administration for DHS, uh, the service providers, private entities that provide the services, case management, private case management, private service providers, all of those people and entities that are falling under the umbrella of DHS services fall within our scope. So if you have a complaint or an issue or question relating to the, the policies, the actions, the services of any of those individuals, that falls within the scope of our agency. Same is true with health and education. Now you also help, uh, somebody's got a due process complaint under IEPs, IFSPs, 504, I, IDPs, you, you handle those as well, correct? Yes, yeah, so long as, so long as the, so a client rights issue, so long as that, those rights either are enforced by, created by these agencies, or relate to services provided under the umbrella of these agencies, we would be able to work on that kind of issue, yes, that would fall within our scope. Thank you, Mr. Um, and then so similarly, I'll just point out a couple of uh, nuances about those terms, facility and program. I want to emphasize that we're not a settings-based advocacy program or entity. We, people do not let, need to live in a certain type of facility. Um, they don't need to receive services from a certain type of uh, regulatory or under a certain type of regulatory scheme. We represent people who live in a wide variety of, of, of licensed or otherwise regulated facilities. So nursing homes, assisted livings, group homes, intermediate care facilities. Uh, regardless of how the entity is regulated, licensed, certified, or registered, there was a clarification in the statute a few years back on this, uh, we can represent them again so long as they're receiving services related to their disability they were in one of our client populations, and those services fall under the human services, health, or education uh, umbrellas. Um, we also aren't limited to residential service related issues. So it doesn't matter where you're living, if you're receiving, say, waiver services, um, and the service issue you have is accessing the community, or you're trying to get a specific type of therapy under medical assistance, um, or you're, um, you have a problem with your day program, it doesn't have to be a residential service. So long as that service falls within human services, health, or education sphere, we can work on that issue. So my point, I think, is to say that while we do have guardrails, there are limits, parameters to uh, the scope of our service, it still remains relatively broad. We get lots of different types of calls and questions and complaints about lots of different types of issues. Um, what kinds of calls or complaints might people call us with? Um, it really depends. Sometimes people are already in service, they have a very specific problem with that service. It's how the county is authorized it, maybe it's the amount, it's how it's being provided, the quality of the service from the provider. Um, maybe it's the wrong kind of service and they want a different kind of service. It's very specific to something that they're already getting. Sometimes it's a front door type of question. Mom and dad have a three-year-old, the pediatrician has told them, you can get in-home help, I'm not sure exactly how, but contact the county. And then they're off down the path of you know, alphabet soup uh, service programs. And they're trying to figure out what exactly are PCA services, how do they differ from behavioral aids, what's this waiver stuff that I've been talking, uh, that people are talking to me about. And they call us because they need some help figuring out the landscape. They, they see certain puzzle pieces and they need to understand what the picture of the puzzle looks like before they can start making informed choices about what might best meet their child's needs. They will call us with those types of questions. Um, so it's not always a problem that they have. We get called with very specific problems and requests to solve those problems. Sometimes it's just confusion. And there's a, you, you all work in the, in the sphere of human services. You know how uh, complicated and technical it can be. And having a place you can go to that understands most of those pieces and can put them in order for you and help you go through a, a thought process of making choices and um, decisions and planning uh, is helpful. And it's not something you can always get from a service provider or a case manager. Um, so they might have general questions. Um, it could be planning longer term. You have a 16 or 17 year old, you're starting to think, do I need to, how am I going to assist my teenager as a young adult? Do I need to get a guardianship? Are there options to guardianship? And they wanna know about those programs. They will call us with those types of issues. Um, so then what do we do? We get those types of calls and, and what kind of assistance can we provide? 
you know, that really also depends on the, the, the individual fact circumstances of the case. Sometimes they're just looking for information, we give them that information, great. It's, it's simple uh, and they get what they need. Sometimes you're dealing with a client in a congregate care setting who has conflicts with the, with the case manager, with other clients, um, with multiple service providers and you start realizing this is, this is a, um, uh, you know, a ball of, uh, of uh, issues and concerns that needs to be unwoven. And so maybe we, maybe my staff pulls together a large group meeting. We get case managers, individuals, representatives, the service providers all together at the table, and we try to tease out a solution that works for everybody from our client's perspective. Um, so it really does depend on what the issue is. But the types of things we will do, um, We'll get the information from the client, we'll get a release of information, and we will seek additional information relating to the issue. It might be hospital records, it might be the service plan, it might be the IEP. Whatever is necessary or related to that uh, client's issue or problems, we'll get that information, review it with the client, and then take next steps. Um, we do have, built into our statute, access authority. We have the ability to contact individuals, to get access to individuals, to get access to their service-related records, to get programmatic uh, data and inf information. We have the right to access physical facilities and, um, and visit the physical facilities. Whatever we need to do to help accomplish our mission and engage in our client services and provide advocacy, uh, we have uh, access authorities under our statute to help us um, complete our mission in that respect. Um, there are some specific things that we do that I'll talk about in a, in a minute or two, um, reviewing reports of serious injuries and death reports. Um, but what do we do at the end of all of this? Hopefully, uh, when we've uh, been contacted and we're working with a client to resolve that client's issue, hopefully we can resolve that in as quick, efficient, and informal a manner as possible, right? You, you call the county, you get them to better understand what your client's needs are and how a different service might be able to meet that need, and you get a change to the client's service plan or you get a change to the IEP, um, or you talk with the provider about providing the services in a slightly different way, and you informally resolve it, and the client's happy, and you move on. Uh, sometimes it needs to be more formal. Sometimes it's a formal letter to management of whoever, the county, the provider. Um, sometimes you need to get state agencies involved. It's a licensing issue, and so you get licensing to open an investigation. Sometimes it requires a at the very far end, a deep dive investigation that results in a public report. We have a specific statutory process. If we're going to issue a public report that's critical of another state agency, we contact the governor's office, we contact the agency, we give them a draft of the report, they get an opportunity to re respond to the report, we attach it to our report, we issue the report with findings and conclusions and recommendations, and then we hope that the system picks up that ball and runs with it, right? Because again, we're not you, we're not the governor, we're not regulation, a regulatory entity. We can identify the problems and the proposed solutions, but we need others to help act on them. Uh, but that's a, another thing, we don't do it often, but another part of an ombudsman, ombudsman's office function is to uh, shine the light on the problem and propose solutions when, when appropriate. Occasionally, I shouldn't say occasionally, frequently, in doing our individual client work, we start to see trends. We see systemic and programmatic issues arise. Sometimes we're able to address those, we frequently address those with administrative agencies, with DHS staff or health staff, policymakers or licensors, you know, whoever is appropriate. Sometimes we can't get an administrative fix and we come to you. Um, we are not as well organized as the state council. I don't have a specific legislative agenda. Uh, I might need to borrow Trevor um, or at least use your website uh, information. Um, but we tend to do our legislative advocacy uh, in collaboration with others. So. If it's a licensing issue and we can convince DHS or health that they need to change their licensing protocols and if they need a change in law or additional funding to do that, we'll support that. If it's an advocacy issue and we need to reach out to our advocacy partners, we'll do that as well. A, a, a good example of that, a couple of weeks ago, you probably all got a copy of the letter that we collaboratively worked on with the state council and with MNCCD uh, addressing the direct care uh, workforce crisis. Um, and that's the kind of advocacy that we'll do. Sometimes it's general and just identifying the problems that exist for our clients. Sometimes it leads to specific recommendations and we, you know, we exist to provide information to help you all get to um, solutions legislatively as well. Um, what are our priority issues? So you're getting the sense of the scope of our work. How do we identify what issues for which clients we're going to work on at any point in time? I'd love to tell you we have a very specific list or a formula for, for doing that. I, I don't think it exists. I don't think that's possible. Instead, 
We look at specific factors or variables that drive our decision making. And frankly, I lean on the professional experience and expertise of my regional staff, individually and collectively, to make good decisions about how to allocate scarce agency resources. Which cases do we take and how far do we take them? Um, if you look at the bottom of the slide, it, it identifies those factors that we're looking at. What's the impact on the individual? How severe or intense is the problem? Is it something that affects the individual's basic health and safety? Is it abuse and neglect kind of issue? Uh, does it involve serious injury? There are some things that we are statutorily obligated to prioritize, death reports and serious injuries, as I'll talk about in a moment. Um, but there's a whole host of things that can be of utmost importance to individuals. Um, and some of them do affect their, their, their health and welfare. Some of them affect their basic rights. Um, and how you decide what issues to work on is more a matter of art than a matter of science. So, Bud, I'm going to interrupt you. Yes. So, Thank you, Chair. I, 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 yeah, this is good. We understand. You know, what kinds of, I mean, I'm sitting here saying, okay, I know you get these calls. I know you have a waiting list. I know it's hard to get, um, you know, some folks are, will say, oh, my God, they're just so, they're so full. They're so busy. They're so, because this stuff is, I, I, I get what you do, but give me the, give me the essence of, of just, how big of an impact in, in what you're seeing as an increase in these priority issues, right? And, and granted, when there's a, a death that happens, you guys have to be you're on the death review committee. You're doing all, we're getting that. But put it to the human element, uh, you know, because what I, what I was trying to get on the fact is there, there's a deep need to have an ombudsman in the state of Minnesota because there's an absolute deep need. And, and, and folks get these calls on a daily basis, right? So... Put the human perspective in here. Is that a, is that a fair question to, to you, Bud? I mean, I just sure. I'm, I I'm, I'm listening to you, and you're you're telling me what the agency does. Okay, this is great, but I want to I want to know how many staff, how many people, what what are the things? I'm trying to get that bigger picture of that. And and if that's not a fair question, then I'll just let you keep doing your thing. So, well, I'll, thank you, Chair Hoffman. I'll I'll try to answer that question um, now, and then I'll, I'll also provide some additional context uh, as we go, but. I know you received uh, a lot of testimony and that there was uh, very thoughtful legislation teed up last session that we didn't quite get across the finish line, focusing on the impact of direct care workforce shortage problems in various types of settings. So take group home settings for as an example. 245D waiver funded group home settings. We get a call from an individual who's told, I, I just told that they're closing down my home. I don't know what my options are. I've got 60 days to do something. I've lived in this group home for 15 years, right? Um, that's going to get our attention. We're going to have to work on and prioritize that kind of case because it's about the services the person gets on a daily basis. It's about their home. Where are they going to live? How are they going to get individual, their individualized needs met? How are they going to live their lives 60 days from now? And the reality is, if this group home is shutting down, there likely are not dozens of other group homes with lots of great openings just ready, willing, and able to serve that individual. So in that sort of circumstance, if we don't go in there and make sure that the person's procedural rights are respected and that the, their, their entire support network around them is working now 24-7 to find good options to replace what's going to be terminated, um, then that person's life is going to fall apart. We, we can't be the case manager, we're not the service provider, but we can force, we can jumpstart the services and systems into action. So we will, that's the type of case that we're gonna spend a lot of time on. And if we're not having a team meeting about this, you know, on Monday, then we're gonna do it on Tuesday because we don't have the luxury of time. So, so for example, you got, you know, the, the report stories of the 48 hour, yeah, the report of the stories of the 144G, the group home closures in a certain city in the western suburbs. I'm not going to say the city, but it's got the same last name as my daughter's name is. So if anybody wants to look that up, they can figure that one out. Um, that is kind of funny. But it isn't funny. The fact is, you know, and, and I know Senator Fate in his district, 70% 70 of the group homes uh, that are under the assisted living piece, it, it, it sit in his backyard, right? And he's experiencing um, some real issues with, with some things that are happening there. So when you look at the fact that HCMC just reported 51 people that should be released from the hospital, they have no place to go, right? When you hear the stories of a nursing home that is $7 million in debt 
and they're going to shut their doors down unless something happens to them. And the nursing home happens to be in a western suburb. And if you want to find out who that nursing home is, you can ask Dave Johnson, who's the you know kind of the lead on that. Where do those people go? Well, it's a mandated service, right? Fifteen mandated medical MA services that a state this state must provide, right? And, if, and if, correct me if I'm wrong on this. If they don't have any long-term care solutions, group home assisted living, then they go to the hospital. But the hospital is telling me they're 17 to 20 percent of their population are people that should be in some kind of setting that you're talking about there. My point is this: the capacity you're you're probably experiencing a lot of phone calls about those issues that I just threw out in front of you. Is that correct? Yes. And they're real, right? And they're real people, correct? Absolutely. So what happens if you aren't able to help those individuals? Then what happens then to that individual? You know, we have a, a continuum of care, a, a spectrum or an array of services in our system. Um, and they And it really ranges from supporting people in their own homes, in their family homes when they're younger and, uh, or if they choose to, con to stay on and uh, live in their family homes or in their own homes, their own homes and apartments, um, all the way up to uh, institutional settings, hospitals, nursing facilities, intermediate care facilities. So depending on what your disability is and your care needs are, when your current care situation falls apart, you don't tend to move towards the more integrated community-based part of that spectrum. You tend to fall into the more congregate care institutional part of that spectrum. When the institutions themselves fall apart, you tend to move to either a higher level institution, like from a nursing facility to a hospital, or you tend to move to a nursing facility that's not in your community. You find a bed somewhere. You can wait, um, and sometimes within certain settings, uh, we can stop discharges from happening or closures from happening until people get appropriately discharged. But in that context, what we mean by appropriately discharged is meeting minimal care needs. We're not talking about Olmstead rights. We're not talking about informed choice. We're not talking about person-centered planning at that point. It's crisis level, meet their basic care needs. And we have seen, obviously, evidence of that over the last couple of years. The fear, and a lot of the discussion right now, is that we're going to see more of that. The demographics and the math are not adding up for us, folks. We, if you look at the number of people who need services over, say, the next 10 years, and the number of people in the workforce able to provide those services, those trend lines are going in the opposite directions, in the wrong directions. So we need to be extremely creative about how we hire and retain direct care staff who want to do the work and would do it rather than working at other uh, non-direct care kinds of positions. Uh, but we also have to be creative and flexible about the policies we have surrounding serving people in their own homes. We cannot just rely rely on uh, congregate care settings to meet their needs because even they have their challenges. So we have to look for ways to leverage informal supports and frankly to convert some informal supports, the supports that mom and dad or brother and sister provides or a neighbor provides, and figure out how to pay people to provide that service because we're going to do it otherwise. We're just not going to do it for that person in an individualized way where they want to live and in, a, uh, in an own home kind of setting. We're going to do it in a, larger in a larger congregate care setting that's not in their community of choice. That's, that's the global problem that we're facing. Now, I'm, I'm also ranging a little bit away from, uh, uh, you know from what? what the Ombudsman's Office does, but we do focus on those issues on a client basis and on a systemic and policy basis. It's important that people understand that's the real human. I want to get to the real human element. I know what you do, but I, I know the difference between a Gretsch drum set and a Sears drum set. I know what you do. That's supposed to go to my Bloys Olson interview, but, but the fact is... I know what you do. I know what kind of impacts you have, and I know the people. and And I don't. I want the rest of the world to hear what you're doing. And that's why I wanted to take this time today to really kind of talk about that. And so, uh, uh, keep going. Thank you. Okay. Let me let me just make sure that we still have. A, I've tried to cover the waterfront here um, with the other things that we do do. Uh, and then, as I said, as you have questions, um, feel free to, to to shoot them by me. Um, let's talk a little bit about deaths and serious injuries. If you provide disability related services. Right. You're going to likely fall under a regulatory structure that requires you to report critical incidents. So uh, under your license, under your 245D license, if you have somebody who gets hurt in your program, you're going to have to report that to DHS licensing. Um, you also likely are going to be a mandated reporter for purposes of the Maltreatment of Minors Act and for purposes of the Vulnerable Adult Act. In addition to those reporting structures, we have our own reporting structure built into our statute. There is a requirement that providers providing services to our clients report to us within 24 hours any serious injury or death that their client experiences. We then have two systems for handling that, for deaths, 
for reports of deaths, we have, um, and I think you referred to this uh, before, Chair Hoffman, uh, we have a medical review unit or team, two nurses and a support staff who review all of the death reports we get. We get, I don't remember what the exact number is, I think we had almost 1,700 death reports last year. Now, in many of these death reports, we get the report from the facility or the, the uh, individual providing the services, and we then get the death certificate. And it's pretty clear that the person's death was caused by natural causes. On those types of cases where it's relatively clear, there's not much else for us to do. Um, but we have a priority list. For certain types of deaths, we're going to have to do a deeper dive. For suicides, for deaths involving multiple medications, for deaths in certain types of uh, intensive treatment settings, uh, we're going to get additional information from those settings. Uh, if there's an autopsy report, we'll get that. And we're going to explore whether there was any particular problem cause of that death. Why are we doing this? There are other entities that, that do um, investigations when there are deaths, right? Um, and our job is not to duplicate the work of other entities. But what we are doing is looking for the root cause of the death. And we're doing that not to take a licensing action, we're not a regulatory body, not to uh, apportion blame or determine liability, that's not the function. We're doing it essentially for a quality assurance and improvement purpose. We want to prevent the same thing from happening to somebody else. If there's a problem within the service or program, a problem with how the facility is, is uh, managing medication, whatever the problem might be, and we can, make a rec we can spot that problem and make a recommendation, and it keeps the same problem from happening again, we've done our job. That's a, that's a significant portion of the work that we do, and it's why this mandatory reporting structure exists. We do the same thing, frankly, for serious injuries. We just do it a slightly different way. With serious injuries, where you have the client continuing to stay in service, continuing to live in that uh, residence or to um, be in that facility, there can be ongoing uh, client-related needs. You might have to change the service plan. You might have to bring in uh, new staff or additional staff to serve that client. There might be additional client advocacy related to the serious injury, again, to make sure that it doesn't happen again for that client. And there might be recommendations that we would make to make sure that that kind of serious injury doesn't happen to anybody else being served under that service or program or in that facility. So for that work, we rely on our regional staff because they're the ones who know best the nuances of the services and programs that our clients use. Okay. I do have a couple of slides in here. I'm not going to go through this all. There, it's an it's a actual and philosophical question about what should qualify as a serious injury. It covers the types of things you would expect it to cover, broken bones, severe lacerations, organ damage, head trauma, but there are gray areas about what kind of head trauma should trigger an investigation and what shouldn't. I will point out a couple of things. Some incidents are significant enough that we really do need to have extra investigation or review of those incidents, even if they don't result in tangible or actual or significant physical harm. Near drowning is a category, attempted suicide is a category. Those are good examples or classic, you know, important examples of that, type of, of that type of incident that requires further investigation. What we do, what our regional staff does when they, when they engage in a serious injury review, is reflected on this slide. They're looking for those problem areas. They're looking to see whether there were medication problems. They're looking to see whether there was a supervision uh, problem, whether there was evidence of neglect. Does that lead to a need for different or new or more staff training? Does there need to be a change in the person's treatment plan? Is there a risk management plan? Was it followed? Does there need to be a risk management plan? Those kinds of programmatic things that we could make recommendations about to, to prevent the, the problem from reoccurring. Okay, let me step back then. That's, that's broadly speaking uh, what we do and how we do it, but let me give you a little, bit of a little bit of perspective, and to do that I have a couple of slides. What what's on the PowerPoint right now, and I apologize for its quality, is a map uh, that divides the state of Minnesota into regions for our regional ombudsman staff. If you go on our website, there's a link to our website at the uh, end of the PowerPoint. You can access this map. You can... Uh, you can uh, zero in on it and you can read it much better. And there's also a list by county of uh, which of our staff are assigned to which counties for purposes of, of obtaining advocacy. You can contact our office, by the way, directly um, with the 1-800 number or the 651 local number, or you can contact our regional staff. If you know who the regional staff person is in Duluth and you want to contact him, you can contact him directly. That information is on our website. But I wanted to show you this map uh, included in the PowerPoint. If, not, if for no other reason but to give you a, a, a visual depiction of what it 
looks like to try to divide Minnesota up into 10 pieces, right? The reality is that the state of Minnesota is, we're not evenly dispersed, right? We don't, geographically and, and population-wise, uh, we have a high density of people, a high density of people receiving services for their disabilities, a high density of facilities and service providers in the metro area. We have far less de density uh, in outstate greater Minnesota. Um, and so the, the regions themselves look differently. You look at Hennepin County on this map, it's the one county we have that we actually have to divide up. Uh, it's too big. There are too many people. There's too high a demand for our services in Hennepin County for one regional staff person to handle it. Um, and, and in fact, my regional staff supervisor used to handle Hennepin County, and she will tell you that we divided up because she insisted that we divided up. So we took a piece of Hennepin County and added it to Dakota. But if you think about how this map looks, you, you begin to appreciate how we have to approach our client services work. I get a call uh, from an individual who really wants to meet with my staff. They've got a thousand pieces of paper, they have a service problem, but they have a hard time explaining that service problem to you. They want to meet with you in person. Okay, so my regional staff decides in Dakota County or Washington County, get in the car, drive 20 minutes, you meet with the client. After an hour's worth of time, you figure out what's going on, you identify an advocacy approach, you give them a solution. Maybe you're able to get that done in two hours. Right? If, it's, if it all lines up perfectly, maybe it's a two, maybe it's a three hour um, interaction, but maybe you're able to get the client the information and the advice and the planning that the client needs. That same client calls my Duluth staff, but now lives in International Falls. Those, those two points are in the same region. Right? My Duluth staff also decides, I've got to go and meet with this client in person. So he gets in his car and drives three hours to International Falls, meets with the client, and then drives three hours back. That same client contact takes three or four times the amount of time just based on where the client lives. That's a reality that we have to deal with. And so, you know, we all, we all understand that a case is not a case is not a case. It's the same issue, same type of problem, but handling it in greater Minnesota requires a significantly different time commitment and allocation of resources than handling it in Washington County would. That's a problem for us, and it's a problem because of the following chart. This, this is a decade snapshot of our case numbers. Um, it's by biennium, so if you look back 10 years at the fiscal year 12 and 13 biennium, we handled 8,600, a little over 8,600 total client contacts. How many staff did you have then, bud? How many what? I'm sorry, How Chair? many staff did you have in 12 and 13 to handle 8,600? Same number of staff. Same, our staff have been, has been relatively flat for the agency's existence. It's, it's varied based on administrative uh, work uh, between about 17 and 19 and a half people. We're currently at 18.6, but we had 10 regional staff. Um, so to handle the vast majority of our client services work, same number of staff. Wow. Um, but so look at the trend line. It's not perfectly linear, but it's going up. And if you look at the last two biennium, including the most recently completed one of uh, fiscal year 2021, we handled over 14,000 cases in both of the last two bienniums, or biennia, um, about 7,200 cases per year on average in the last biennium. So let's do the math. I've got 10 regional staff, I've got two nursing staff in my MRU, I've got three management staff, me, a deputy a client uh, uh, services supervisor, regional staff supervisor. Let's assume that you can cobble together managers and, take, and have us add up to say two FTE. So you're getting, let's say we have 14 FTE. That's, in, that's, that's being generous. But let's say we have 14 FTE staff to handle 7,200 cases in a year. That's over 500 client contacts per person. That's over 10 per week, it's over two per day. If my Duluth staff decides every day that he's gotta to drive to the corners of his region, the math doesn't add up, he can't do it. He can't even have just a face-to-face -face client meeting on a routine, regular basis if it requires that kind of driving and keep up with his cases. He'll be behind, woefully behind, and possibly behind, you know, inside of a month. So we have to, those, those, those priority areas that I talked to you about earlier, we have to have uh, a very judicious approach to our staff time and resources. We have to do a good job of identifying what's, what's the most important thing to focus on today, this week. We can't make over commitments this week without knowing that we'll get important calls next week and not be able to field them. It's, it's a basic math problem. And, um, and, uh, and you're hearing that, members, you're hearing from, from folks that had, 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 had you, you think about the amount of phone calls that you're getting and the amount of needs that are out there just because of the fact. What, what you saw uh, Dave Dively's team put together, we had 25, it's one in four. I used to say one in five. Now I can say one in four people live with a disability in Minnesota. One in 10 is chronic, right? And it's like um, to see these things and but I, I'm, I'm 
trying to get it to the point because I know members have to leave for a five o'clock. So if they start leaving, you don't don't think it's you or think it's me. It's the fact is they just have to leave. But um, it's it's important that people understand. You have to prioritize. When when I when I call you and I have a concern because my due process rights, um, you you didn't give me a fourteen day notice on an, on an IEP and it went into effect, right? Something that should be just a simple conciliation conference meeting, right? You're not going to prioritize that, although it is a problem because it is a due process problem. Your civil rights have been tampered with. Um, you have to like prioritize who gets the first level of of, um, of assurances here, correct? I mean, and, and, and this is clearly evident that this is why when you hear people say it's hard to get a hold of the ombudsman, it's hard to get a hold of the ombudsman, it's because you are overwhelmed. Is that a true statement? That is a true statement. I, I, overwhelming, I, let, me, let me back up and, and just say. Well, let me rephrase that. I don't mean overwhelmed. You got a whole lot of calls and a whole lot of people calling you and you got capacity concerns. How's that? Is that better? That's, that's definitely fair. All right, I mean, thank you. If, if I can speak on behalf of my staff, if they were all here, I think to a person, they would say they, they find this work to be the most rewarding work that they've done. You yes. know, it's, it's very interesting. I, I've only been in the position for 13 months, full disclosure. I was at the at Legal Aid and Disability Law Center for about 24 years before that. I've worked with the Ombudsman staff quite a bit over, over that time. Uh, but it's been eye-opening to see how, once you're inside the agency, you know, wherever you are, you get a better sense of how they actually do the work. So what um, do you need, but I'm going to go to, I'm going to get to that. I'm going to cut to the chase on this. I, I, we love what you do. What do you need? I mean, as you're thinking about going this year, right? Think about the needs that specifically when you're looking at these charts, and I know you're in the next couple of slides, you, you talk about the, 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 what you do at the department. But, but think about um, as, we, as we look at what's happening in Minnesota and, and what we've, you've been flat since 2012, right? Um, what, what's the exact need that's out there in order to assure that people's due process rights? Because because I hear you, and and when I hear you say it's only going to get worse, trending right? That's a statement. That's a trend statement. Um, that causes me to give my um, a little bit of a, a bubble of I should be listening because when we're thinking about collectively, this group is going to figure out just what the next couple of years are going to look like in 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 what we're doing, right? And so what is it that's missing? What, what is it that you can help us understand about what's really missing to assure that people's rights are not being violated in Minnesota? <laughs> that's going to take more than five minutes, uh, Chair Hoffman. Well, I then I guess you need to set up some meetings to come visit with everybody here, right? But it, is You know, it, 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 uh, it takes a village, right? Um, an office like mine exists because it's not reasonable to expect that um, that every state agency, every, every entity, whether it's a state agency, whether it's a local agency, whether it's a large service provider, is going to do its job perfectly. It doesn't happen. That's, you know, we're, all, we're all human and we can't expect that level of perfection. Um, faced with crises and challenges, faced with a pandemic, faced with the demographic challenges we have, uh, we know that those jobs are going to get harder. So while we can hope and expect and support DHS licensing, in its regulatory efforts, for example. We can't expect that they're going to do licensing perfectly, right? And that they're going to be able to enforce all client rights, let alone uh, service expectations, perfectly or comprehensively. So you need to have an advocacy network that is avail that's available to step in and provide that assistance uh, when the systems that we otherwise have in place can't do it, right? Um, in terms of the advocacy network, I would look to my, my colleagues at the state council. I think we could triple advocacy resources in the state of Minnesota, across nonprofits, across state agencies, and I don't think you'd have people sitting around with nothing to do. I, I, the demand is that high. Because you can, always, you can always move to the next level of concern. How fine do you want to be? How serious do you want to be about enforcing Olmstead rights in the most integrated setting? It's, it's a challenge. And I, every day we hear from folks about how things are falling short for them. And it's just a question of how much short and where you focus. Um, I do want to say 
uh, I, I do want to, uh, as people have to leave, I appreciate that. Um, I do uh, appreciate being uh, allowed to come in and, and talk to you folks about what we do and about how we do it. There are some things that we don't do. We're, that not, are, that fall we're, outside not, our we're not done with you, bud. You're, yeah. you're going to come back a few other times. <laughs> but I get a bad feeling some... that you're going to stay here until 6, and so am I. No, um, you, no you're going to keep, no, that's fine. Keep going. Some, some things, um, you know, we don't do criminal justice system issues, but we do work with folks who are adjacent to the criminal justice system, you know, who are trying to be diverted from it. So whether it's the 48-hour rule or whether it's a juvenile issue where you're trying to get them access to services rather than process them through the, ju through the juvenile system, uh, we will work on the diversionary s services and systems. We don't provide advocacy on federal programs. Even though Social Security exists and can provide services or supports to people with disabilities, we don't work on federal programs. So there's a whole range of stuff that we can't get to, but if somebody calls us about that, we will provide information and referral to those folks. Um, there are other things that we do do that I haven't covered in any kind of detail. We're the Civil Commitment Training and Resource Center, which means that we create documents and forms to be used in civil commitment, um, and we do trainings related to civil commitment. So any stakeholder that has to deal with civil commitment, social service workers, other advocacy organizations, defense panel attorneys, they might ask us to do a training, we do it. To get to some of your question, Chair Hoffman, about um, what do we need? What would we want to do? We've been engaged in a strategic planning process now for about the last six months. I spent the first half of the year listening to my staff, trying to figure out how we do things, why we do things, um, what we do well, what we could do better and do more of. There are some very specific things that we'd love to be able to do more of and that we will have a plan to do more of. It's just a question of whether we'll have the resources to do it. We want to do very strategic, targeted... I'm going to stop you right there. Okay. $1.825 billion in the surplus should have been spent in, in human services. I'm just going to tell you that right there. And so it should, you, when you said resources, it just was a segue for me to just put that plug in there. And so that's who I am. I just wanted to make sure that everybody knows. Did you know? That, I appreciate that, Chair you. Hoffman. Um, I, you know, it's not just us that needs to do a better job of this. It's, it's almost every part of the system. We need to do a better job of getting out and about and doing trainings and targeted outreach. There are traditionally underserved uh, individuals, pockets of the state geographically, communities, BIPOC communities, people with certain types of disabilities and receiving certain types of setting, uh, services in certain types of settings who we just don't do collectively a good job of getting to. DHS doesn't do a great job of doing outreach to them. The counties don't do a great job of doing outreach to them. And so they're left behind. They don't have the same kind of access to services. They are not allowed or able to make the same kind of informed choices as others by virtue of their circumstances. And we know uh, that these individuals and communities exist and we need to do a better job of getting to them. And so while we talk about that, the, the issue is what do we give up? In a flat uh, resource environment, if I come up with a very specific training and outreach program, you've got to be serious about it. You don't want to overpromise and undeliver in that area. You already have people who are accustomed to having phones hung up on, questions unanswered, promises broken. You have to connect with them. If you do the effort to, to connect with these communities, you have to be there to provide advocacy resources. And if you do that, then you're, you have to treat some of these other calls. Your percentages start to shift. Right? As we have increased demand anyway, our percentages shift. The amount of deep dive client advocacy we can do or investigations we can do, the percentage of number of those types of cases we can handle go down, and the numbers of quick, brief service uh, information and referral onlys go up. And the same would be true with training and outreach. You have to choose when your pie is only so big, what's the most important stuff to do? Uh, and it's a challenge. So what would we do if in an ideal world where our pie started to grow bigger, uh, we would do far more training and outreach to try to get to the people who have not had access to our services and don't have access to the types of services and supports that health, human services, and education are have available to them, but they just don't know how to get there and they can't otherwise get there. That's something in particular. We'd also do a lot more deep dive investigations. The type, type of thing that takes 15, 20, 50 hours of staff time, we do a lot more of that to try to highlight systemic problems and come up with solutions. That's what we'd be doing. No, I, we have ideas, <laughs> but ideas need, need the, the resources and support in order to be able to implement that. Uh, no, you're a, you're a great resource, but the, the agency that you oversee, you're a great resource on that. So members, I know we have to, um, we have to close up shop here, but uh, thanks for sticking around and thanks for hearing this. And Bud, we, we do want to have you come back. Uh, your information is on there, how people can get a hold of you and get a hold of the uh, Office of Ombudsman. And so... Uh, I hope members found this to be a, a productive conversation uh, today. And I, I do. I appreciate you and uh, spending time with us and, and David Dively and his team for spending time with us. So 
Bud, do you want a final comment uh, to us? And, and then we will be adjourned. What are you thinking? Just to say that I, again, appreciate you having us here today. And I remain a resource on whatever you need. Any, you now have a, a good sense of what we do. So any bill that pops up and you want my insights or my staff's input, uh, you know how to get a hold of us. Thank, thank you, you, Chair. Thank, thank, you, thank you, members. Thank you. Members, final comments, anything? No? We're adjourned. <laughs>